Welcome to the Mohegan. This is my world. I don't dig the one that's out there. Not a good time for me, so I create my own world of art, beauty, love, passion, caring, kindness, and the highest level of the renaissance that I can live within me because art is the way of finding the true meaning of the human spirit. This is what I create around me. Look at all these beautiful flowers. Yeah, I just hide in here. Ba, 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 ba. Come on in, come on in. Special seat for the special guests. And I got my basil. Yeah, take, I take care of all the plants. All the plants, love beauty, love beauty. Yep, warms my heart. So when I bought this place, I was gonna turn it into a restaurant. And I've been bartending, you know, since I'm a young guy. Matter of fact, my sister, who I just brought up from the nursing home, opened up the second topless go-go lounge in New York City, Grace's Lucky Lounge. So I know a thing or two about bartending. Bartended my way through college. But my buddy said to me, listen, Gerald, you better not turn this place into a restaurant because we're gonna have to get you out of jail because I'm not the kind of guy that could put up with bullshit from shitheads coming in and giving me crap. So uh, I built it out like a restaurant anyway, but I never opened it up as one. And one of my favorite things is Zidzi juice. Zidzi is the Neapolitan dialect for auntie. And that's Zidzi over here. I wrote that book with Zidzi gave Honey Boy and the woman Doris Roberts who played the mother of the TV series, Everyone Loves Raymond. Her last starring role was playing my aunt. Anyway, this is some dizzy juice. And what it is, it's all brandy. And then what I do is I chop up loads of different kind of dried fruits, cherries, dates, raisins, and then I let it set in there. And so I want to thank you all for being here. Salute. Fine, mellow, and soft. Just the way I like it. So I built this place out like this because I write about all the ugly shit going on in the world. And it breaks my heart. So to get my mind off it, I create beauty. A wonderful woman I knew, girlfriend for a while, Marie-Pierre Astier, great artist. I'm sure some of her artwork. And uh, she used to say, art is the way of finding the true meaning of the human spirit. Matter of fact, Marie-Pierre's brother, uh, Francois, was the left shoulder of Jacques Chirac and Mitterrand. And my close combat teacher, John Perkins, used to go to Palace of the and work out with them. So I'm a fighter. You know, I'm a very peaceful man, but I attack the attacker. And that's what I'm doing now. I'm fighting for freedom because it's been stolen from us. If I have to read about six, eight hours a day. To get my mind off it, I have well over 200 plants in this place and I take care of all of them. I mean, the magazine's what, 150 pages plus a week. I surround myself with beauty and so that's what I have. Oh, this is a great guy, Earl. He was a painter up at the Hudson. He was in Danamora for a long time in the, in the prison and he used to just pick up stuff around and uh, pieces of wood, everything. And, and now this stuff is worth a lot of dough. So I surround myself with beauty. I cook, every day I try to cook. 42% of Americans are obese. 70% are overweight. And the reason being is that they eat shit. You know, I just turned 76 years old. I'm not gonna be an inmate in a nursing home. I do everything I can to stay healthy. Do I drink? Yeah, I drink. I have a couple of shots of Zizzy Juice every now and then, maybe a couple of times a week. I am who I am because of where I grew up and the different things I've done in my life. Here, let me show you over here. Yeah, this is me at um, 30 years old, picking up Ronald Reagan at the Chicago Hilton. We're coming down the elevator, him, Mike Deaver, and uh, myself. He starts one thing after another, Chicago, the Windy City. And it was one cliche after another. So he looks at me, he says, how do you like Chicago? I said, listen, I said, in one year I made three mistakes. I got married, I bought a Chrysler, and I moved to Chicago. He didn't think it was funny. We got in a taxi cab in those days. He didn't even have a, a car, he just, hey, we went over to McCormick Place. We put on a big uh, big event. And I put on a brunch for him and 16 of our board of directors before he did the main talk. And um, this is two days before he's announcing he's running against Jerry Ford. So here I am, 30 years old. And here I began my career. I 
Love blooms on the campaign trail. There's my lovely wife. May she rest in peace, Marianne. We got divorced. It wasn't a happy time for that. But anyway, I was running a major campaign. I was working. I, Angelo Martinelli became the longest-running mayor in Yonkers. And then they sent me up to Albany, and I was the assistant to the secretary of the New York State Senate. Worst job I ever had. I quit after one year. Wasn't my trip to see grown men grovel. So what happened is we hire a fucking slob to open the door. Senator Frank Smith, Senator Tom McNeil. I said, you know, buddy, I said, what's the matter? These guys can't open the door by themselves. What do they got this guy opening the door for? And then we're bullshitting. We're young guys. Like, I'm, you know, 26 years old. You're talking about chicks, uh, cars, and sports. And, and they'd follow the senator to his seat. And they, you could blow on these seats. Poof, beautiful seats. And they pull out the seat and help him sit down. They come back. I say, hey, man, what's the matter? Cat can't sit by, down by himself. He needs some help. You know, Gerald, you have that kind of an attitude. You're not going to make it here. It's me. It's not my trip. My one of my best friends, Brian Donahue, his wife Mary Donahue became uh, the lieutenant governor of the Pataki. I quit. I I ended up teaching how to run political campaigns. I I designed America's first course in American politics and campaign technology taught at St. John's University. And then I got the job uh, with working for this trade association. I was killing environmental legislation at the height of the environmental movement. All I wanted to do was make money and have a good time. And I was a young guy. I was staying at the Willard Hotel at 28 years old and putting my meetings on the Hay Adams. And a lot of other stuff too, man. Hanging out at Blues Alley. <laughs> and anyway, I started growing up around 32 and I quit. And this whole long story. But anyway, and that's my, my family. And every day, every day, every day, I thank them. Every day. That's Dizzy. That's my aunt on my mother's side. And this is my parents' wedding. May they all rest in peace. 1934. Look at the dignity of these people. Bezos, you can't come close, Jack. Not even close. Here, this is my father. Worked in a fish store. Look at him. They worked in factories. They were laborers. Look at it now. Cook. Yeah, cook, man, you can't fry anything. In the Bible, they say the, um, the meek shall inherit the earth. They got it back. They, they misspelled it. The geeks have inherited the earth. Yeah, a fucking shitty T-shirt and jeans. How about dungarees? And that's what they call the dungarees. Yeah, Levi Strauss invented them when they were doing the gold mining in California. Yeah, this is my parents coming back from Italy. 1920. That's my mom. That's Dizzy, my Aunt Viola. I don't know if that's my Aunt Pepper, my Aunt Ida, my grand. Look at, look at, look at them. So every day I thank them. I thank them for everything they've given me. I'm only me because of where I came from. A Napolitano, born in the Bronx, 1946. Woo! America's at its height right after the war. Yep. Born to be free. And boy, was I. I ran away from kindergarten. PS 76. Can't make that up. Spirit of 1776. And first day in kindergarten. Time to take a nap. And all the kids go like this. Go down and float me. I'm taking a nap every day. I'm just sitting here. Gerald, it's time to take a nap. So I lay down on the floor. Next day, time to take a nap. I lay down on the floor. As soon as Miss Rose turned around. Woof, choo, choo, whoop, whoop. I crossed the Boston Post Road, which was the major artery before the highways between New York and Boston, ran away from kindergarten. <sighs> They'd have me drugged up now. They, they took me out because they couldn't, you know, they couldn't control me. They used to tie me to the crib with nylon stockings because I'm out the window. <laughs> Could you imagine? They'd have my parents locked up now. Anyway, I was born to be free. And I thanked them every day, every day for all that they've given me. All my aunts and uncles are kindest, loving people. Ah, that's my great-grandmother. Look at the dignity. Look at the dignity of this woman. And look how people dress like slobs now, huh? Yeah. Look at them. Look at, look at these people. The Great Depression. Anyway, here's a photo of me and John Connolly. John Connolly is the guy that took the bullet in the back sitting in front of Kennedy, Governor Connolly. That's the book depository. 
1992. He wanted to meet me because of my book, Trend Tracking, far better than Megatrends, Time Magazine. Back in 1989, I wrote that there'd be a new third party and someone like Ross Perot would be the kind of person they were looking for. So he wanted to meet me. I'm gonna make a very long story short. As we're walking back into the Anatole Hotel, he said to me, you know, I read your book, Trend Tracking. He said, fine piece of work. And I know your heart's in the right place, but you don't have a clue what's going on. And neither do the American people. Because if they did, there'd be a revolution in this country. Not only was he the Democratic governor of Texas, he became the Treasury Secretary under Richard Nixon, a Republican, when they took us off the gold standard. I could go on. This is a uh, 78, and it's, it's not the right cover, but that's the cover that I had, and that's Les Paul, and he autographed it for me. He wanted to meet me. He was playing at the uh, Iridium down on I think, 57th Street. Broadway around there, and um, I get a call, he wants to meet me. He used to listen to me on the Joey Reynolds show. Anyway, he was, I've, I've been with presidents, prime ministers, and princes. I know what the deal is. And uh, people better stand up. You know, people don't like my language. You know, it's situational language. I'm very polite and I'm very nice. You know, if you fuck with me, you got the wrong guy, all right? You don't say, oh, please don't hit me. Oh, I'll be good. You know, and, um, you know, it's just terrible, terrible that people lost their fight. So anyway, I surround myself with beauty, artwork everywhere. The pizza oven was made from scratch. This was a walk-in cooler over here. You can see the drain over here. And uh, this is all, you know, insulation and tarred on. We had to chip off the tar. You couldn't take it off with a solution. Here, here's, a, here's the old Mohegan market. That's what it was back in the uh, late 80s. That's what it looked like. So all the windows are closed up. Crummy door over there. I got all that glass there now. That's when I was in Puglia. Every time I go somewhere, I try to bring something back from from where it is, yeah, and uh, yeah, so that's it. You know, again, that World War II is in ancient history. And I tell the story of why I own the three of the most historic buildings in America, right around the corner. I came back from Berlin in 2012. I left on April 17th. 2012 came back on April 27th. And they're showing me around where East Berlin is, and you know, I drive. I'm saying, this place is beautiful, parks everywhere. No building over 16 stories, I mean, it's beautiful. And I'm having a beer, sitting with the people, looking across the street about two o'clock in the afternoon on the main drag over there. And I see a beautiful 1880s, maybe, German building. At the same height, all new construction. And I realized everywhere I went, I'd see these beautiful, beautiful German buildings and all new construction, blown out from the war. And Berlin was grander than Paris before it was bombed out. And I'm thinking to myself, in the 1930s, the Germans were the height of Western civilization, scientifically, culturally, philosophically. And I'm thinking of all the great German names, Beethoven, Bach, you know, Bach. And I'm saying to myself, where were the people? Why didn't you stop this? That's what happened to this country. From that to this, a toilet bowl. Look at the way the people look. Look at the way they dress. I go out to eat. I see guys my age with fucking baseball caps on. Younger guys wear them on backwards. What are you waiting for, a catcher's mask? You know, how about some style and grace? Could you get that one, man? It's gone. If we don't have a renaissance, what followed the Black Plague? The renaissance. The people realized they were fucked up, they were killing themselves, so they went back to the past. Are they Romana al antica, in the manner of the Romans and the ancients, to describe the quality of their work? And look at the fucking shit that they make now. Everything is shit. The furniture's shit. Everything looks like shit. The cars. I mean, when cars had style, every little fucking car looks alike, like a small hearse. No style. All gone. All gone. Because the bigs have taken over everything. There's no choices anymore. When I was a young guy, there were grocery stores. There were hardware stores, there were stationery stores, and now there are grocery chains, hardware chains, drug chains, stationery chains. We've been chained, chained, chained. 
And we're spending all this fucking money sending kids to school. For what? What does it cost? Like, I think it's like $140,000 from kindergarten to, to 12. To get a, so you could drive an Amazon truck or work at a fucking Amazon place? Oh, I think I'll drive a uh, FedEx truck. I think I'll get a job at Walmart. No, I'd rather work at Target. The old days you had these jobs and, and you built yourself up. If we don't turn this around, again, World War II is not ancient history. This is going to be World War III. It's already started. Hey, Frank, give me a gun. Give me a hand grenade. I want to go blow this guy's brains out across the street. Frank gives me the gun and the hand grenade. I blow the guy's brains out. Is Frank an accessory to the crime? This is mission creep like they did in the Vietnam War. Go back to Dwight D. Eisenhower, five-star general, supreme commander of the Allied forces, and listen to his farewell address, January 17th, 1961. The military-industrial complex is robbing the nation of the genius of the scientists of sweat of laborers and the future of the children. This country wasn't supposed to have a huge standing military. It was only to be there if we needed it. The plow makers, just, then they turned into making, you know, tanks and other stuff. They just changed. It wasn't about a war machine. We have evil, satanic, demonic people in charge. And if we don't rise to a higher level, Jack, you're dead. It's over. And they're taking us there. So, you know, another thing, by the way, in talking about how I get my mind off it. Oh, by the way, this was sent to me from a fan from Switzerland years ago and um, says it perfectly. And this is my, these, these are my tapes. I can't play the music, we'll get uh, you know, blacklisted. But here, I got thousands of hours of tapes. 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 Of hours of tapes. One after another. Give it. Now it's one bad rap. And that fucking stupid beat everywhere I go. Boom, 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 boom. Not an ounce of boogie, not a drop of jive. They killed it. They killed it. The geeks killed it. And the people swallow their shit. I don't carry a cell phone. That's right. One of the only guys around that doesn't carry a cell phone. I did work for the cellular telecommunications industry back in 1994 when they had these boxes and trunks with an aerial. And I read about radio frequency radiation beginning then and keep reading about it now when they publish it. According to the University of California, Berkeley, if you're on a phone for 17 minutes a day for 10 years, your chance of getting a brain tumor only increased by 60%. So anyway, I don't carry it. So I, I love music and I get my mind off it. And again, I surround myself with beauty. I take care of all these plants. There's my desk back here, by the way. So nobody sees where I am. I just hide behind there and do my work. And then when I sit down for dinner, of course I give my guests this seat here because this is my favorite view from back here. When you look from here, sitting over there, that's what you see, so. And a number of these plants come in for the winter. That one over there, this big one over here, another one over there, come in for the winter. I have all southern exposure here, so things really go great. And I got my oregano, rosemary, basil, you know, I gotta have the right stuff. Now let me show you upstairs. I told you, that was a walk-in cooler. I took the door from that walk-in cooler. This used to be a passageway that went out to the next door. And that's what I did with it. And the temperature is perfect. Ah, fan sent me this. This is Napoleon's march to Moscow, leaving Poland with 420,000 men and coming back with 10,000. It's a famous chart. You don't beat the Russians, it's very simple as that. Operation Barbarossa by Hitler, they killed about 20 to 25 million. There's a great peace speech by JFK in June of 1963, five months before they assassinated him. And he was saying basically the same thing, you know, you don't fight the Russians. And then he says how great the Russians are culturally, scientifically. He said they're good people. And he goes on to say how many of them were killed. 
and that we share a lot. And then at the close of his speech, Kennedy's speech, again, this is June 1963, five months before he's assassinated. He said, America will not go to war. Eight months later, after he was assassinated, he took us to war in Vietnam. Yeah, this is some of Marie Pierre's work. And there's a fan sent me this one, the Bronx. I'm a lucky guy, a Napolitano, born in the Bronx. And that's Millennium by Marie Pierre. Taking the great from the past and bringing it to the future by Marie Pierre Astier. Yeah. Nobody, nobody talks like this anymore. Nobody. No, only about geek world. Well, everybody's fucked up on their, their high-tech shit. And again, you read the studies how this stuff fucks you up. Again, I don't carry a cell phone. I, I got a flip phone. I hardly know how to use it. And I only take it when I have to travel, you know. And that's, that's about it. Yeah, let me show you inside. So this is all destroyed up here. And when you look to the left, this is what I did with it. Built a stage. It's all rotting. You see the ceilings, all water everywhere. I take care of all the plants, clean the place, take care of everything. And it gives me the spirit. So I create my own world to get out of the one that everything's so fucked up. This was my parents' wedding present, 1934, from my father's side. And back in the 50s, they used to paint everything white and gold. I, I took all the paint off it. An old Atwater Kent radio. It works, too. I haven't put it on in a long time. I brought these on. I went to Vietnam. Let's get you up here. I got these in Vietnam, too. Yeah, these are Vietnamese. Yeah, so that's it. That's the place. Art, music, fine food, fine wine, and fine people. Every day, you know, I try to make things as nice as they could be. Thank you.